and I guess it's uh, 11, 12, right around in that section, uh, Jesus is talking to a man named Nicodemus, and I think it'd be appropriate because of the place we are in the Gospel of John to first of all go flip back to the end of John, not the very last chapter, but the next to last chapter, the last two verses of chapter 20 remind us, uh, John John uses the inductive method. Remember, he, he's going to lay a lot of material out there and build and build and build until he gets to the end. And at the very end of his book, he said, this is why I wrote. So uh, uh, usually we tell people right up front, okay, here's what the speech is about, here's what the class is about, and then you give the outline. Every now and then, I, I personally think it takes a really gifted teacher to be able to use the inductive method because uh, uh, too many times your students are like, okay, what's this about? What's that about? There's another story. There's another story. Where's this going? You know, and you got all these stories and got all this information, and then it finally comes together. And uh, that's exactly what John does. So the uh, last two verses of chapter 20, Jesus performed, it says Jesus, this is verse 30 and 31, it says Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. This is a great example with Nicodemus, because Nicodemus, chapter 2, is the very first sign. What was the very first sign Jesus performed? Water. The water to wine at the, at the wedding in Cana. How do we know that's the very first sign? It says so. Because it says so. Very good. Uh, I, I just want to emphasize this again. The way it says so is very specific. It doesn't just say number one. It uses the word meaning in the beginning. This is where it all started. So it's a very specific word that John chooses to use. Okay. That's the first sign that happened in chapter 2. Here we are in chapter 3. The very uh, Well, there's another event. What happens, after the, what happens after the wedding feast? What happens at the end of the second chapter? There's Something that makes Jesus very popular with some and very unpopular with yeah. others. What was it? The temple. Cleared the temple. Yeah, yeah. Uh, clears the temple, cleansing of the temple. Okay, then we get here at the beginning of the third chapter, he's talking to Nicodemus, and one of the first things Nicodemus says is we know you have to be from God. Why? Signs. Yeah, doing all these signs. Well, in John, we've only got one sign so far. And they weren't there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, right. So John tells us at the conclusion of his book, he says there are many other signs. I, I just didn't focus on those. How many signs does John focus on? Yeah, it depends how you count it. In his public ministry, there are seven, but there are nine major signs that are, that are given throughout the ministry. A lot of people like the sevens. And in this public ministry, you can, not, you can count it that way. But there are a lot of signs not recorded in John that the other gospel writers give us. And John's just letting us know there's a lot more. So he said, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name, right? That's his thesis statement. Flip back to chapter 6. I know we're not there yet, but flip back to chapter 6. One of the, I was going to say, one of the more famous chapters in the book. Every chapter is famous in the Gospel of John. It's just, it's just a famous, it's in a famous book called the Bible. So, Chapter 6, look down at uh, verse uh, 28. Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, John chapter 6, verse 28, it says, uh, th th this would be the crowds coming to Jesus, and they ask him, verse 28, what must we do to do the works God requires? I'm going to pause on this just a little bit, because this is an issue we've talked much about, because it's in my estimation, terribly misunderstood in churches across our country. Because if most people would ask religious leaders today, what are the works we must do to please God, most religious leaders would say, none! Can't do any works! It's all grace! Well, yeah, we're saved by grace. But according to a lot of religious leaders today, Jesus' answer is wrong. Well, I would submit Jesus is not wrong. <laughs> I would submit that the world's really messed up on this because here's the question. They say, what are the works that we must do that God requires? 
What are the works that we have to do? And Jesus answered in verse 29, the work of God is this, to believe in the one that he sent. Okay? Is believing a work? In what sense? It requires us to do something. Yes! Accept the grace. So, is it okay to say that God requires works in the sense of you must do something? If I'm missing something here, point it out to me, please. Because that seems pretty obvious, doesn't it? He, they say, is there some, can I word it this way? Is there anything that we have to do? And Jesus says, yeah, yeah there is something you have to do. Believe. Yes? The problem is they think that everything you do has to somehow tie to salvation when you start talking about works. And it's like, well, you know, once I become saved, I'm saved. But that doesn't mean you lock yourself in a closet and wait for the end. <laughs> so obviously there are things we're commanded to do. The problem is they want to tie everything to say, oh, well, if, you're, if you say I have to do, I can't lie or steal anymore. Say by grace. I'm like, no, 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 you misunderstand. I'm not talking about Jesus. I'm talking about what you should be doing to show your changed life. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Some people just way overemphasize this. And I just want to make the basic distinction first. In the sense of works meaning something we do, is that required? Jesus said yes. John said that's the whole purpose of the book. So, in the broad sense of the term, do you have to do something? The biblical answer, and I hope our answer is yes. Yes. And by the way, it's more than just believing. There are other things that God asks us to do, such as repenting, such as confessing. such Anyway, there are things that God asks of us to do. Now, having, I hope, established that principle, is there a sense in which there are some works that we can't do that Jesus has to do for us. Yes. Of course. Uh, we usually refer to them as works of merit, <clears throat> works that accomplish, works that that affect our, our salvation. Yes, we believe and trust in Him for what He can do for us. Sure. But even, even in, the, in the broad sense, as far as once we become a Christian, are there, thing, are there works that God expects from us? Yes, there are all sorts of works of the Spirit, indwelling presence of the Spirit. There ought to be fruit of the Spirit in your life. Well, that's, depending on how you define the word, it, but biblically, you can call it a work. Is it required? Yes, it's required. Guess what? You're in the light now. Do you have to continue to walk in the light? You sure do. You sure do, according to 1 John chapter 1. If we walk in the light as He is in the light, the blood of Jesus His Son keeps on forgiving our sins. Well, is there something we have to do? Yep. The Bible says there's something we have to do. I always think of the parable of the talents. Yes. Yeah, there, perfect example. There, there, are, uh, there are things from beginning to end God does expect something from us. And the basic idea here, the one that John's going to focus on, is belief. James tells us, though, that there are some who believe in Jesus that are not going to be saved. Who's James say believes in Jesus, but they're not going to be saved? Yeah. Demons! Yeah. Okay, that's, that's a pretty good example. <laughs> Somebody who believes and knees knocking, trembling in their boots, however you want to say it, they believe, they believe in Jesus, but it's not the saving kind of belief. Well, that's why John's writing this book. Because just like there's two different kinds of works, just doing something versus earning something. There's also, I, I know you could delineate this a, a little bit better, but in a broad sense, there's two different kinds of belief. You can assent. You can, you can say, oh yeah, I believe that. That's not the kind of belief that Jesus is looking for. He's looking for a kind of belief that he's been explaining through the whole book. That's why I wanted to remind us of this, because as we go through all these examples, we're going to look at Nicodemus, and we're going to find out a little bit more of what kind of belief that we're talking about. Because we're not just talking about, oh yeah, I think you're from God. Nope, nope. Uh, Jesus says to Nicodemus, that's not good enough in essence. He says, you've got to be born again. You've got to be born again, right? He's going to talk to the woman at the well in the fourth chapter. 
It's going to deal with the man that's been lame for 38 years in the fifth chapter. It's going to deal with the feeding of the 5,000 and especially the disciples after he walks on the water in the sixth chapter. Every chapter, we're going to get a little bit more and a little bit better insight. What does this belief really look like? What, what do I really mean when I say I believe? Remember the classic illustration of Blondin, right? The guy who walked a on a tightrope across Niagara Falls. Yes. I actually looked that up once because I always thought, well, that had to be a legend. No, it's in the encyclopedia somewhere. So, But this uh, Blondin uh, went on a uh, tightrope and he, and he also took a wheelbarrow and uh, put bricks in it and pushed it on that tightrope. And everybody was so impressed and he had enough bricks in there representing the weight of a person. And so he asked the audience, do you believe I could push a person? And everybody said, yes, we believe. And then he said, who's willing to get in the wheel? <laughs> well, it's a classic. I've always loved that illustration because it's a classic distinction between assent, yeah, I believe you can do it, versus biblical faith. Biblical faith is not just assent. It's a trust. So it's a, we usually refer to it as a get in the wheelbarrow kind of thing, <laughs> right? I believe it enough that, yeah, go ahead, push me in the wheel. That's trusting belief. Okay, John's going to help us better understand that. Here we are with Nicodemus. Who is Nicodemus? Pharisee. He's a Pharisee. He's Sanhedrin, which is what? Yeah, high council, like the high court of the land, right? And he's referred to as teacher of Israel, which is a respected term. Uh, people look up to Nicodemus. Uh, he doesn't understand what Jesus just told him about being born again. And so Jesus uh, responds to him in verse 10. Jesus answered and said to him, You are a teacher of Israel. How do you not understand these things? Verse 11, Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and testify of what we've seen, and you do not accept our testimony. Okay, let's answer the question first. Why does Jesus go to the plural? Who is Jesus speaking on behalf of? You're speaking on behalf of God. Okay, so in the middle of a conversation with this religious leader, he, instead of just answering, he throws in another element. He goes to the plural. In other words, instead of, let me just give you an answer, let me throw you a curveball. Let me throw in something else here that's going to challenge you to think even a little bit more. So instead of just... He's already explained to him what he meant by being born again. Did he get it? No. Uh, have we made note of I think we have made note of this. Uh, I, I've decided as I go through this again, I'm going to try to make a list of all the things that Jesus said that it seems apparent nobody got and Jesus knew they didn't get it. Such as in chapter 2, destroy this temple. In three days I'll rebuild it. Not even his followers got it until after the resurrection. Right? They didn't understand that one. This, when he talks to Nicodemus and saying being born again, he didn't understand that. Why am I emphasizing this? Because this book is about belief. And it's as though Jesus constantly, it's not, it's not enough to just, oh yeah, I'm from God. Jesus is constantly pushing. Or can I say it this way? Raising the bar. Okay, you got that. Let me throw something else at you. Because it's, it's this idea Am I just gonna? Am I just gonna say, "Oh wow, this is hard. I don't get it. I'm going home." Or am I going to? Ah, I don't understand that either. Can you explain that to me? Can I find this out? Can I? Can I do some research? That seems to be what Jesus is doing time and time again. He's pushing people to just because, like in Matthew the 13th chapter, the people who didn't understand parables, a lot of them went home. But some of them came up to Jesus afterward and said, can you explain that to us? And what did Jesus say? No, no, there's only certain people I'm going to explain. No, everybody who came and asked him, he explained. So it's the seekers, the ones who Jesus pushes and the ones who will be pushed are blessed because of it, right? Okay, I'm, I'm taking too much time here, but I, I think when he throws in the plural, he's taking it up a step. Look at verse 12. If I told you earthly things, and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Okay, what does that sound like? Okay. Yeah, it sounds, it, it not only sounds like you don't get it, it sounds like, you'll never get it. Yeah, what, yeah, what, yeah it sounds like, what's wrong with you? 
like we gotta go back to 101 <laughs> yeah, and start over right. because you, you don't know this. Right. You're not gonna get this. This does sound like a reprimand, doesn't it? A uh, gentle reprimand, but nonetheless, he's pushing. Isn't he pushing? I've, I've got written in my notes here, Jeremiah 12, 5, where Jeremiah's complained to God, and, Jer and God's response was, Jeremiah, if you are tired running against foot in a foot race, what are you going to do when I bring the horses out? So he's, he's not saying, oh, it's, it'll be okay, Jeremiah, let me pat you on the back. No, he's saying, it's going to get worse. <laughs> yeah. It's going to get harder. So Is, the, is he also saying plural when he says you? Oh, I did not check out the you. Uh, I, I don't believe so. You you mean not just Nicodemus well, but a bunch? When he when he says truly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen. Yes. You do not accept our testimony. I'm thinking, well, Nicodemus might have accepted it, but I'm thinking the you is going back to the Jews. You know, you. Yeah, Mike says you. Does somebody people. have a blue letter Bible? You people. Okay. You people is what Mike says. Does it? Yeah. Well, we can. Well, that would be plural then, but we can check it and just, if somebody's got the blue letter uh, Bible open, you can click on it and see if it's plural or not. It's plural. Is it plural? It is plural. Thank you for saying that. Good, good. So it's more than just Nicodemus that he's addressing here. I'm so glad you pointed that out. Good. Okay, verse 13. Uh, no one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. I find this so interesting. Uh, the way Jesus sets this up, because he's telling him where he's from. He's saying, I'm from heaven, right? Later on, there's going to be a big controversy, and uh, the people who don't like Jesus, and there are people who are just looking for an excuse, okay, there are a few excuses they hang their hat on. There are a few excuses that they grab, and the biggest one's probably Sabbath. It probably uh, more frequent, uh, more emotion involved, because he broke the Sabbath. That's why we have to be against it. But there's another big one that the Gospel of John focuses on. What is that? Call you don't himself. know where you're from. Okay. Call himself God. Yeah, calling himself God, that's a big one. And the fact that, yeah, number. It, though, they're going to say it a couple different ways. We don't even know where this guy's from. They're going to say that once. And then they're going to say several times, we know where he's from, and he's not from the right place. Okay, what do they mean by that? What's the right place to be from? Bethlehem. Bethlehem. Where do they think he's from? Nazareth. Nazareth. Well, he, he is from Nazareth, but he's born in Bethlehem. They didn't know that part. Well, Jesus is several times going to push this issue right back at him. He's going to say, you think you know where I'm from? Do you really know where I'm from? But usually, and this is going to happen... I think it's six times over in chapter six, he's going to say, I'm from heaven. I'm from heaven. But he's, and that's really going to bother the Jews too. What's this guy doing saying that he's from heaven? Well, I think he's pushing the issue. Do you really know where I'm from? You know, you think you know where I'm from, but that, that's, that's kind of a, uh, a, a test of the bigger issue. On one issue, if you think you've got this right and you're wrong, well, what about everything else? Shouldn't you double check on, because these, these are eternal issues. These are big issues. These are God issues. Shouldn't you do some more homework and really make sure that you're getting the right information? I, 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 I just see Jesus pushing that issue so many different ways. And he, he's saying right here, I'm from heaven, verse 14, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up. When did Moses lift the serpent in the wilderness? What was the occasion? Snake. Yeah, what were the snakes doing? Biting, biting, biting people. people. Why were the snakes biting people? Because they had complained. Because they grumbled and complained. Uh, they were complaining against uh, one of the many occasions that they were complaining about. Why did they take us out of Egypt? Everything was so nice back in Egypt. You know, we had nice food and everything. Oh, yeah, we were slaves. I forgot about that part. Yeah, yeah they, they were just, you know, just remembering the good stuff. And they were complaining about their circumstances, and as a result, God said, in some translations say the fiery snakes, but the snakes in that bit them, poisonous snakes. And then they cried out to Moses and said, okay, we were wrong to complain. And Moses prayed to God on their behalf, and God's response was, 
bronze snake and put it on a stick and put it in the middle of the camp and tell people if they've been bitten by the snake to look at the bronze snake and everything will be better. Okay, I, I'm going to do this again. I'm sorry if you've heard me do this before, but to me, it's kind of like, okay, you, you find out you got cancer. Terrible. You go to your oncologist. He's a specialist. And he sits down with you and says, okay, this is really bad, but I, I know what we're going to do. I'm going to show you this picture of this cancer cell. Now look at it. Okay, you feel better now? <laughs> you know, and, and it's kind of like, no, what does having look, you know, what does that have to do with healing me? What does looking at a snake have to do with getting rid of, poor, you know, if, he, if God would have said, okay, I want everybody to get these uh, bandages and tie it around your leg to cut off the blood supply, and I want people to suck the blood out, or whatever they do, you know, <laughs> hash marker, yeah. or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the Westerns, they always did that when they That's took their right, knife, right, yeah. and they cut, and they sucked some blood out. So. You, you know what? I, I would have been, okay, that makes a lot of sense. Suck the blood out. Don't swallow. Yeah. You know, make sure you spit it out. <laughs> but this, this seems to have absolutely nothing to do. I think there's good reason why God said this, but on the occasion, the, the bottom line is this. It may seem silly to you, but it's what God said. Are you going to do it? Are you going to do it? You have faith. Okay. And you, that's right. You had to get in the wheelbarrow. You had to trust. Okay. Now, now that Jesus comes, though, that thing that God told him to do in the Old Testament now starts to make sense. Because how's the poison of sin, how's all this going to be taken care of? It's going to be taken care of by Jesus when he goes to the cross. So being lifted up is a reference to the cross. In fact, he's going to make this reference more than once, and he's going to be very specific about it. And later on, they're going to figure it out, what he meant by this, right? But here, still talking to Nicodemus, he says he's from heaven, and as Moses looked up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up so that whoever, whoever what? <laughs> Believes in him will have eternal. You have to trust God in the Old Testament and you have to trust God now. Okay, another footnote here. Whatever happened to that bronze snake? <laughs> it was destroyed. Who, when did it get destroyed? Hezekiah. Was it Hezekiah? Yeah. How? Okay, this is really going to push. But... How long was it between the wilderness experience when they made the bronze snake to Hezekiah's time? A long time. A long time. <laughs> <laughs> it is going to be about uh, around 700 years. Six, 700 years. What they do before they destroyed it with Hezekiah? Worshiping it. They in were worshiping that thing. Well, let me tell you, this is a really special snake. <laughs> let me tell you the story on this snake. People had poison in them, and looking at this snake made you made them all bad. Well, uh, it was God. It wasn't the snake. Jesus is going to have to do the same thing when they talk about the manna in the wilderness. It's going to, oh Moses, he was a great guy. Moses gave us manna. Well, the first thing Jesus said is, it wasn't Moses who gave me the manna. <laughs> you, you totally misunderstood this. It was God working through Moses. Was there a hand over here? Well, I find it interesting because they worship the same. Um, Jesus died on the cross, and over time, we worship the cross. Yes. A lot of people do. And, you know, they did the same. You know, it's like we this repeating pattern. You know, people just keep on. So Solomon was right. Yeah, you know, the second commandment talks about not using idols in the worship of God. And I, I wonder sometimes, uh, uh, the cross represents something very wonderful, but sometimes the cross, sometimes other things that we can put our hands on and stuff, sometimes we focus on those things. And I, I, I wonder if maybe... Maybe we're uh, going in a direction God didn't want us to go. You know? Okay. Okay. Um, so he's talking He's talking about, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. The very next thing he says 
In verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes, okay, he's talking about this belief again, right? Whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. This is in the context of explaining the belief and it's also in the context of Jesus saying he's from heaven and he will be lifted up. I think he's making uh, uh, reference to the cross. Um, very famous verse, but also the following verse, verse 17, for God did not send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Okay, please take note of this. Jesus will say more than once that God gave him the right to be the judge. Gave the responsibility of judging over to him. So obviously God's not contradicting himself. It's explained once we get over to chapter 12. Do you remember this? Chapter 12, verses 47 and 48, Jesus will say again in verse 47, he will say, I did not come to judge. It says it more than once. I didn't come to judge. But then he'll say, there is a judge. However, that very word that I have spoken will judge. I can't remember if he says you or them on the second or third person. But will judge you on that day. What does that mean? Does Jesus judge us? It's like works. You could say in a sense he does, in a sense he doesn't. Okay? In a real sense, who's your judge on judgment day? You are. In a real sense, you are. Because Jesus put his word out here. Here it is. And you got to decide what you're going to do with it. Can I, can I say it this way since we're studying gospel or not? You got to decide if you really believed it or not. Not just a sin, but really believed it. And based on that, on Judgment Day, Judgment Day is not going to be a day where judgments are made. It's Judgment Day where judgments are disclosed or declared or announced. Judgments that you made while you were alive during this life. I mean, stop and think about the, the stories that Jesus tells about Judgment Day. Are there going to be... I mean, think, think of it this way. When people come before God, is God going to go, hmm, hmm, let me think about you? Yeah. <laughs> no. He doesn't have to make, make those kind of decisions. Judgment Day is a declaration of what has already been decided by you, by the way you lived your life, and the choices you made during this life. So... And frequently, when he says things like this, I put a note in my margin. Chapter 12, verses 47 and 48. So he did not come to judge, but there is a sense in which uh, you will be judged by how you respond to Jesus. Okay, verse 18. He who believes in him is not judged. Okay, okay. So this kind of gets back to what he's going to say over in chapter 12. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Isn't that, isn't that saying the exact same thing he's going to say over chapter 12? It's up to you. It's up to you. Uh, verse 19. This is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light for their deeds are evil. This is kind of an explanation of chapter 12. That very word I spoke is going to judge you on that day, right? So it's challenging us to think about our lives. Okay, let's think about our lives in the context of light and dark, right? It says, here's the judgment. Light came into the world and men rejected it. And why in the world would they reject the light? Because they really like the darkness. I know you've heard this before, but really bad people hate really good people because really good people show really bad people how really bad they really are. Sometimes when there's light, you can see you can see stains you couldn't see before, right? Uh, the better the light, the more you can see the problem. And sometimes, sometimes people don't like that. They, they, they don't like the light. It says in verse 20, for everyone who, everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices, he who practices the truth comes to the light 
so that his deeds may be manifest as having been brought about by in God, brought in God. What does your translation say there? In God or by God? Through God. Okay. Okay. Oh, all about all about your relationship with God. I've got another footnote here. You've probably heard me tell this story before too. There was a there was a missionary in Venezuela years ago when we were involved in supporting uh, a couple different mission works on there, team expansion, and also um, a missionary by the name of Jorge. Any of you remember Jorge? Okay. Uh, one of our one of the trips we took down there. He was uh, telling us that a huge problem that he had in the area where he was working, he said alcoholism is like, I don't know, 75% uh, of people are alcoholics where he lived. He says it was just a huge problem, huge problem. And so one of my first questions is, well, you know, how do you deal with that? And uh, his response was, oh, we don't. <laughs> Wait a minute! You got you to deal with that. That's a sin, you know. You you got to deal with things like that. And his his response, and he was being very sincere, and very honest. But he said, "All we do is focus on Jesus." And he said, "The more they fall in love with Jesus, the less alcoholism is an issue." And I and I thought, well, that, you know, it makes it sound maybe a little bit oversimple, but that really is the core of any issue. Mm -hmm any issue, uh, not just drinking any kind of sin. It's a matter of, if Jesus is really precious to you, then you know what? That stuff started. We want to stay away from that. Yeah. Well, it lends credence to the fact that really, like you said about we're our own judge, yes. um, freedom to make the decision. So, what we as Christians need to do is focus on <coughs> Showing them the truth and everything, so that they can make that choice they have the freedom to make, and not be you know, surprised if they make the wrong one. Pointing out their sin and getting on them uh, is not going to do anything. <coughs> in the, in, at least in the beginning. <coughs> <coughs> yeah, yeah. To me, it, it's more a matter of instead of pointing out. Okay, that's a sin. This is right. That's wrong. This is right. That's wrong. It's more a matter of who do you really love? Who do you really want to please? And it, and this might just totally mess up my illustration. I'm sorry if it does, but it just makes me think. Have you ever had somebody real close to you, like your wife, say something like, "If you loved me," <laughs> and then fill in the blank because they're do that? It just seems like that's the setup for so many different things, right? If you loved me, you would have known. If you loved me, you would have done this. If you loved me, you you would have... That, that was a priceless look, by the way. Also, though, it, it really points out the sanctification process because, you know, when you first become a Christian, you just don't get rid of everything that's been bad. Right. You know, so right. you slowly have that process of becoming more like Christ by doing the studies and getting closer Thank to you. Christ. That's very good. And that enables me to, because I didn't want to just leave that illustration, I didn't want to just poke fun at this, because there is a sense in which, I, I'm guessing maybe you guys are fellow strugglers with me, because, yeah, I really do love my wife. I really do. I'm just a guy, and I can't read your mind, and I can't, and I can't do this, I can't do it. And so it is a growing process, and I really do want to do things that show her that that I that I love her, but it's not a it's not it's not a check off the list thing. It's a matter of where's your heart? What do you really want to do? But but the the growing process that's very true sanctification. Okay, okay. Um, verse twenty two. After these things, Jesus uh, said, uh, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he was spending time with them baptizing. John's going to make it very clear a little bit later on, though. Jesus didn't do any of the baptizing. He had his disciples do the baptizing. Oh, we talked about that before, right? Why is that significant? Because he didn't want the people saying he was baptized by Jesus. Yes, yes. Because uh, remember over in uh, 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, as important as baptism is, and that's the very point Paul's making, it's very important. But he's saying, I'm glad I didn't baptize a lot of you guys. And why would he say that if it's so important? 
start using the, like the status. Yeah, because he didn't want something so important to become a source of division in the church. Some people, some people were saying that they they were followers of Paul. Some were followers of uh, Cephas. Some were followers of Apollos. And he says, guys, no, uh, we, we don't need division in the church. And sometimes things like this, people will say, well, I'm better than you because of who baptized me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, anyway, he's spending time with them baptizing. John also was baptizing in, in Anon near uh, Salim because there was much water there and people were coming and were being baptized. For John had not yet been thrown into prison. Just an editorial comment that he puts there. So John's continuing his ministry, preparing, uh, not just preparing the way for Jesus, but he's gonna say, I must decrease and he must increase. He's still supporting Jesus' ministry here. Verse uh, 25, therefore there arose a discussion on the part of John's disciples. This is an example of this very point. His disciples, with the Jews about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing and all are coming to him. Do you detect a little bit of uh, jealousy? That'd be a good word here. It's kind of like, hey, wait a minute. Instead of the crowds coming out to us, the crowds seem to be going down the street. <laughs> They're going down to... Uh, uh, Jesus and following him and John answered is verse 27 and said a man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven what does he mean by that what what, what are you talking about when you talk about things from heaven what are you you're referring to uh, usually you're referring to God uh, 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 what is it the Lord's Prayer your will be done in earth as it is in heaven right okay so the will of God in uh, the point uh, don't misunderstand this. The point John's making is, listen, I'm just doing what God wants me to do. Uh, it's not my agenda here. It's not what I want. This is, I'm just trying to fulfill God's will. Verse 28, you yourselves are my witnesses that I said I am not the Christ, but have been sent ahead of him. You know that it's not about me. My job is to prepare people to meet the Christ who's Jesus. Verse 29, he who has the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. So this joy of mine has been made full. He says, it's not my wedding. It's not, it's not about me. I've, I've done enough weddings where I just want to shake people and say, it's not about you. <laughs> Would you just focus on the bride and the groom? That's what, that's what this is about. Sorry. Back to the point. John gets this point. It's kind of like, it's not about me. It's about Jesus, and you know what? I'm so close to Jesus, I'm such a good friend. If the spotlight gets brighter on Jesus, the more it gets brighter, the more I like it. I could care less about me. That's, that's the point. Kind of gets back to what we were talking about earlier, about the light, about uh, focusing on him. Verse 30 makes that famous comment, he must increase, I must decrease. Verse 31. He who comes from above is above all. Okay, I, I should have started counting this because over in chapter 6 he says it six times. But this is twice here, again, from above, right? He who comes from above is above all. He who is from the earth is from the earth and speaks from the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. Point, Jesus is divine. He's from heaven. Verse 32, what he has seen and heard, of that he testifies, and no one receives his testimony. Okay, Jesus came to his own, but his own received him not. Remember when he says that in the very first chapter? Mm -hmm. So he's from God, but people aren't receiving him. It's going to, in fact, in fact, in chapter 6, do you remember how many people were fed when he took the five loaves and two fish? 5,000 5, men. Uh, <laughs> Matthew tells us women and children in addition to 5,000 men. At the end of that episode of the lake, after feeding of the 5,000, how many people stay and how many people have left? Over 5,000 left and only the 12 remain. Only the 12 remain. 
So I think it underscores what he says right here. Many people, they want something from Jesus. They want a healing. They like to see the miracles. They come to him to be fed. But when he really challenges them, they don't receive his message. Don't receive his message. Okay, uh, verse 33, uh, whosoever has received his testimony has set, uh, has set his seal on uh, to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God. So most don't receive, but those who do are listening to the very words of God when they listen to Jesus. For he gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into His hand. Uh, gives the Spirit without measure and given all things into His hand. Jesus, it will say it this way at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given unto me. So He has complete authority and I think that's what's being emphasized here. Verse 36, He who believes, uh, we're talking about belief again, aren't we? He who believes really trusts in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life. Okay, okay. before I finish this verse though, what's he pitting belief against here? Either you believe or, I would say either you believe or you don't believe. That's not what John said. What did he say? Reject. Either you believe, either, either you believe or you disobey. Either you believe or you disobey. Okay, what does that tell me about belief? I'm getting a little bit better picture here of belief. It's a trusting kind of belief that also does something. It's obedient. Obedient trusting belief. He says, He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Uh, uh, either you accept Jesus or you reject Jesus. And if you reject Jesus, there's, there's no life. Not the kind of life that He came to give. But to accept Jesus means to trust and it means to obey. Okay, we're getting a fuller picture as we go. Any questions or comments on that before we go into chapter 4? Yes, John. I, I, a long time ago, I heard uh, someone, a teacher, say that the word belief was made up of two Anglo-Saxon words. To be and to live and is to live. be in, in leaf in accordance with is to huh. live in accordance with. Do you know what I mean? No. I don't no, know I should have gone back and looked that up. But uh, a lot of times the English words have some really interesting flavors and they really do fairly represent the Greek word that they, you know, but by use we've kind of thrown it, thrown it to the side. But yeah, I like that. Yeah. Do some homework for us. <laughs> Check that out. I love that. I just reminded me. Uh, I really like that. That's good. That's good. But uh, there are just too many times when, it, in everyday discussion, especially the word faith, but even the word belief, when you're talking with somebody, I, I'm so tempted to say, what do you mean by that? Especially uh, faith, well, both faith and belief. Because uh, if you're talking about biblical kind of faith, or you're talking about biblical kind of belief, I'm all over that. But uh, we don't always use the term that way. Okay, chapter 4. Chapter 4, classic story. Uh, chap chapter 4 is a woman at the well and a royal official healing at the distance. Those are, those are the two major stories in the fourth chapter. Uh, background of the fourth chapter, this woman at the well, what kind of woman is she? Samaritan. Samaritan woman. Okay, you gave me her cultural background. What's her uh, social standing amongst the Samaritans? Very low. How do you know that it's very low? She's not by herself at the wrong time. Yeah, day she's day. coming out to get water at noon. When do most women come out and get water? First thing in the morning. Not only is she coming out at noon, how many women are coming out with her? <laughs> yeah. uh, pretty good indication you're a social outcast when there's no social. <laughs> there's just you, right? Uh, indication of why this might be the case. The question that Jesus asked her is, Go and get your, go and get your husband, and she responds by saying, "Yeah," which in the Greek language is only three words. It's kind of like she doesn't want to answer the question at all. <laughs> uh, uh, I know man is what it literally says in the Greek. 
And anyway, she doesn't want to talk about that. And Jesus said, well, you're right. You've had how many husbands? Five. And? And by the way, you're living with somebody right now. Right here. <laughs> okay. So it's, it's a woman that uh, he's going to talk about the very things that she probably doesn't want to talk about. But it's in Samaria. And what we're going to find out here is uh, John, I hope, I think, and I hope we see this, is really going to help us expand our idea of what it means to believe by telling this story. But, let's do a little bit of background before we do this. Yeah. Um, I don't quite remember. I remember some of it. A Samaritan is considered lower than a Jew. Why? Thank you. That's the background I want us to do. I, I want us to make sure we understand this. The best reference I've got is... Uh, <laughs> 2 Kings chapter 17. 2 Kings chapter 17 gives us a storyline of where the Samaritans come from. Uh, um, uh, Northern Kingdom, Southern Kingdom. Let's go, let's shift our minds back to the Old Testament times, right? Uh, you've got one kingdom and then it splits. Uh, it splits after Solomon. Remember Solomon's son's name? Rehoboam. Rehoboam. And the kingdom splits. And the southern kingdom from this time forward is referred to as what? Judah. Yeah, the kingdom of Judah. Northern kingdom, we're going to call it either the northern kingdom or Israel. Or there are occasions where it's called by one tribe's name. What's it called? Ephraim. Sometimes we call it Ephraim, right? But that's Israel, the northern kingdom. Of the two kingdoms, which one's worse? Israel. <laughs> yeah. This is so interesting because northern kingdom's worse. But Jeremiah is going to come along and say, no, you guys are worse because you saw what happened to the, the terrible people up in the north and you didn't pay attention. Right? So which one goes first? Israel. Yeah, Israel. Northern kingdoms wiped out first. Southern kingdoms taken into Babylonian captivity. But the northern kingdom is not taken into captivity. And it's not the Babylonians. It's the empire before the Babylonians. And who, who would that be that takes... The northern kingdom out. Assyria. Assyria. The Assyrians do. When they they disperse the people of the north, but they don't leave the territory that they've taken over, they don't leave it uninhabited. In the ancient world, that'd be the dumbest thing in the world for you to do. Because if you leave a territory uninhabited, what happens to it? Something else makes Yeah, have you ever had your lawnmower break and then you heard it? <laughs> but yeah, yeah, things do not stay in good shape when people aren't there. And uh, wild animals come in, and it specifically mentions the wild animals and different things that happen. Okay, things are not going well. They they don't they disperse the people, but they don't leave it uninhabited. They leave some of the Israelites who've survived there. But part of the strategy of the Assyrians is to bring other people in and have them intermarry. Have them intermarried. This is one of the reasons I want to bring this up. Is there a problem with intermarriage? It depends what kind of intermarriage you're talking about. I, I just feel like works. It depends what kind of works you're talking about. Believe it depends what kind of believe. intermarriage. It depends what kind of intermarriage you're talking about. This is a great example in 2 Kings 17. In fact, if you, it turn to that with me, because I, I, I want to look at a couple of these verses. 2 Kings the 17 chapter. But here's the story. Here's what happens. They intermarry and things... There's people in the land, right? And so the king thinks, okay, people in the land, land ought to be okay. No. Still having terrible problems. And the word comes back to the king. The reason they're having terrible problems is they're not serving their God. And so the king of Assyria says, well, find me one of those priests that used to be in Israel. I'll send them back there to teach them how to serve their God. So the priest comes back and teaches them. And then the Bible makes a very strong point that they started worshiping God on the outside. But in on the inside, they weren't worshiping God. Let's read those verses together. 2 Kings chapter 17. This is where the Samaritans come from. Look down at verse 32. 2 Kings 17 verse 32. It says they worshiped the Lord, but they also appointed all sorts of their own people to officiate for them as priests 
in the shrines and the high places. Okay, there's two warnings here. Shrines and high places, what's that all about? And what's the problem with appointing their own people to officiate? Who's it supposed to be? It's supposed to be in the line of Aaron. In the line of Aaron from the tribe of Levi. Levi. Right, that's, <laughs> that's where the priesthood is supposed to be. But the shrines and high places were supposed to be eliminated. Okay, verse 33, they worship the Lord, but they also serve their own gods in accordance with the customs of the nations from which they have been brought. So it sounds like, yeah, I'll go to church, but I'm also going to do this. I'll, I'll do that, but I'll also do this. Skip down to, well, no, look at verse 34. It says, to this day they persist in the former practices. They neither worship the Lord nor, nor adhere to the regulations, the laws, and the commands that the Lord gave the descendants of Jacob, whom he named Israel. Skip down to verse 40. They would not listen, however, but persisted in the former practices, even while the people were worshiping the Lord, they were serving their idols. To this day, their children and grandchildren continue to do as their ancestors did. Okay, paints a very specific picture here. They intermarried with other people, but what happened? Instead of worshiping God, they kind of worshiped God on the outside, but they brought all the other religious practices with them. What happened when, when a guy named Balaam wanted to get paid by Balak, but every time he opened up his mouth to curse the people that he was being paid to curse, a blessing came out instead, right? He, he did it three different, well, four different times total, bless God's people, but he really wanted his money, so what did he tell Balak? He told him to use the Moab women to entice the Jews. Okay, he, his advice was just intermarry. But not just intermarry. When they intermarry, what are they supposed to do? Lead them away from God. Bring They're their religious God. practices as well. And as a result of that kind of intermarriage where it was, can I say it this way, interfaith? Different kind of faith, different kind of religion, different kind of belief. How many people died in one day? Do you remember this? 23,000 in one day, right? 24 or something total, but 23,000 in one day. And so, does anybody remember the name of the guy who brought an end to the plague? Phineas. 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 I love Phineas. that song. Yeah. Does anybody remember the name of the lady? No. Oh, no. <laughs> what's, her, what's her name? Was it Cosby? Cosby! Cosby. For some reason, I always oh, remember that because it's some comedian. <laughs> okay, back to, back to this. I, I, I don't want to just go awry here. Uh, let, let's bring this all together. Uh, what was happening to the Northern Kingdom? Inter, interfaith marriage. Does it sound like God's really against it? Yeah. And there were some terrible things happening to him. What happened with Balaam? Interfaith marriage. Was that a problem? Well, 23,000 people died in a plague one day. I'd say God says, I don't like this. Does that apply to any kind of intermarriage? No. And the clear example we've got for that is Numbers chapter 12. And in the interest of time, let's just review this. A guy named Moses marries a woman from where? Midian. <laughs> yeah, from Africa. From Was it, was it a Cushite woman? Cushite, Is that what it says? Yeah. Yeah. And put and push the two ancient names for Ethiopia in the the region around Ethiopia. Uh, he marries a black woman, and Moses's brother and sister. What's her names? Miriam, Miriam and Miriam. Aaron. And probably Miriam's more vocal here about this. Anyway, are upset that he married a black woman. So they start being disgruntled and speaking against Moses. And so God calls him out, and the first thing God says to him is. I can't, sorry, <laughs> I have to be careful how I word this. I was going to say, can't believe you're speaking against my servant, Moses. Well, that's in essence what God says to him. He said, my other servants I speak in dreams and visions. I, I, I deliver my message through dreams and visions, but not so with Moses. By the way, this is the passage, Numbers chapter 12, that says Moses was the most humble man who ever lived. That's, a, that's, that's really something. Anyway, uh, God said that, and then after he reprimands, Miriam and Aaron, he punishes Miriam with what? A disease. What kind of leprosy? It makes it very specific. Her skin was white. 
white as snow. I love that, because it's as though Miriam was like, so mad that he married a black woman that, that God said, oh, you like your white skin. Give <laughs> you white skin. And, and it turned leprous, right? And so Moses prayed on her behalf and cried out. And God said, well, she's going to have to have it for seven days. Seven days. Okay. Inter, intercultural, inter, uh, intermarriage with different races. Is that okay? Sure. Intermarriage with different faiths. Is that okay? No. no. Is there any place in the New Testament where it says that should not be? Yeah. Second yeah. Corinthians chapter I mean, six. Here's here's what. Yeah. It talks about being unequally yoked and gives several examples. But right in the middle of that passage, Second Corinthians chapter six, it says, "What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever?" Yeah, this, the, the faith thing is huge. It's, it's huge in God's God. What was the problem with Samaria? Was it the problem in Samaria because they mixed races? No. The problem was they mixed their faith. They mixed their faith. And the Samaritans no longer followed and worshipped God the way God told them to. We have a couple clear examples of that. Instead of going down to worship at the temple, where did the Samaritans worship? At the shrine. Yeah, there are these two big mountains. You remember the names of the mountains? Mountain where they pronounced the blessings and the curses when they came into the land. Gerizim was the blessing. What's the curse? Evil. Evil was the curse. I just remember it sounds like evil. Yeah, that's good. So they built a temple on Mount Gerizim, and she's actually going to bring that up. And in talking to Jesus, but we're out of time. Just wanted to set the stage here because the issue is not intermarriage. The issue is faith. It's a matter of faith. If you're following God or not. And guess what? Jesus is going to be more open and He's going to respond to these people. They need to know about Jesus just as much as anybody. But He's going to be more open with the Samaritans than we've seen Him before. And I find that very interesting. We'll talk about that next week. Let's pray. Gracious.